I will talk about uh, some uh, work uh, we have been uh, doing and we are still uh, continuing on uh, transcriptome guide analysis of uh, highly multiplex immunohistochemistry images. So as uh, probably most of you uh, know, uh, immunophenotyping, namely the study of heterogeneous cell populations by profiling uh, protein expression with antibodies, is key to understanding immunity and disease pathogenesis. It has played a major role in the study of autoimmunity, uh, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lupus, and so on and so forth, um, in cancer, in particular in the study of intratumor heterogeneity and the tumor microenvironment, and more broadly in uh, the context of uh, immunology. So over the past uh, decades, there has been uh, several very powerful technologies emerging for uh, cytometry. Uh, which allows to rapidly phenotype thousands of cells based on dozens of proteins. Traditionally, those uh, cytometry technologies have been uh, not especially resolved. Uh, the canonical example would be flow cytometry, uh, which in the current uh, versions as uh, spectral cytometry can profile uh, 20, 30 uh, proteins uh, simultaneously from, from an specimen or mass cytometry, which also can profile uh, routinely uh, up to 40 simultaneous uh, proteins from, from a sample. More recently, there has been uh, uh, new technologies uh, for uh, cytometry that are spatially resolved. So these technologies allow you to uh, simultaneously profile uh, a panel of, of uh, antibodies targeting multiple uh, proteins in a tissue section with single cell resolution. Co-detection by indexing, uh, CODEX, uh, which is uh, developed by, by Akoya, uh, is one of the example of, of that. There are others like imaging mass cytometry, digital spatial profiling, and, and so on and so forth. So these technologies, uh, as I was mentioning, allow you to profile uh, around 30 uh, simultaneous proteins from a tissue section um, and therefore open new uh, avenues in the uh, study of uh, tissue architecture. So this type of, of data, uh, although not extremely high dimensional, is uh, high dimensional enough that require uh, computational methods uh, in order to uh, be analyzed. Um, so the standard uh, type of approaches that are used with all these technologies, both spatially resolved and non spatially resolved, are uh, what are called automatic gating uh, approaches, which are algorithms for dimensional reduction and uh, clustering. Some examples would be Exif, Phenograph, Spade, uh, Disney, and many others that I'm sure uh, you are familiar with. And these type of uh, methods, they can uh, handle large antibody panels, but they still require uh, some laborious manual annotation. So basically, the, the user needs to, to go uh, cluster by cluster uh, over the clusters produced by these uh, methods looking at the presence or absence of protein combinations and annotating each of those clusters uh, with some uh, biological term based on uh, those combinations of proteins. So it has some challenges. Uh, first of all, it requires well-curated antibody panels uh, for which uh, we understand uh, in an accurate manner uh, what uh, marker, what cell populations are labeled by each uh, marker. And moreover, uh, very often it will be hard to uh, annotate uh, nuanced cell types or cell states, uh, especially if there are no uh, specific markers in the panel. So very often we will find that a given cluster may be a combination of multiple cell populations that cannot be easily distinguished based on the markers in the panel. And also situations where two different uh, clusters uh, differ very little in the levels of uh, the uh, antigens uh, that have been profiled with that antibody panel. So it's uh, hard to interpret in biological terms those uh, differences. And that leads me to the other uh, challenge uh, that I, I think uh, the, the current state of, of the art faces, which is that um, traditionally these uh, studies have been based on predefined sets of markers and, and getting strategies that have historically evolved uh, by trial and error. And the precision and efficiency of, of uh, those commonly used uh, markers and getting strategies is uh, unknown in, in most cases. So uh, 
this has led to misconceptions on the purity of uh, isolated populations, uh, which uh, have ultimately affected in some cases for understanding of uh, fundamental biological processes. One example uh, would be, for instance, in the context of uh, hematopoiesis, where for a long time uh, the, the standard uh, understanding of hematopoiesis was based on a succession of um, intermediate uh, progenitors that were then becoming committed into different lineages. However, more recent uh, studies, uh, like this study uh, here by Belden and, and collaborators, and, and other studies that appear recently, have shown that uh, many of those um, uh, in discrete intermediate uh, uh, progenitors were actually kind of artifacts in, in the sense of uh, that they were due for uh, they were due to misconceptions in the purity of uh, isolated populations by by facts and the way that it really uh, evolves uh, hematopoiesis is, is really as a more continuous differentiation process where cells evolve continuously in, in cell state space and at some point become committed into uh, different lineages. So these are kind of the, the challenges that uh, I think the, the field is uh, facing. Uh, and these challenges motivate us to, to ask the following question. Can we leverage uh, existing single cell uh, RNA sequencing data sets to automate the identification, annotation, and gating of cell populations in multi-parameter cytometry data? So as you know, in single cell transcriptomic experiments, uh, the expression level of uh, thousands of genes is typically profiled in, in, in each cell. And therefore, these data sets, they have a very high resolution in cell type and cell state definition. So one can annotate usually those uh, cell populations very accurately based on their uh, transcriptomes. Moreover, it's a very active field of research. There are hundreds of new data sets that are being produced uh, each uh, year, and uh, especially uh, since uh, there are also very large uh, collaborative efforts like the Human Cell Atlas. And moreover, uh, some of the most recent uh, technologies uh, or approaches like SiteSeq, uh, ReapSeq, and, and ABSeq um, allow you to not only measure the transcriptome of individual cells, but also to profile the uh, expression of a set of surface markers, surface uh, proteins uh, in each of the cells. And the way to, to do that is basically by conjugating um, uh, antibodies uh, with um, polyadenylated uh, uh, oligonucleotides that will act as a sort of uh, synthetic genes. Uh, so basically when we profile the uh, uh, endogenous uh, mRNAs using single cell uh, transcriptomics, we will be also profiling these uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, RNAs that are attached to the antibodies, and therefore we will be determining the abundance of those antibodies in each of the uh, cells. So using these technologies, using these approaches, basically we can uh, determine the relation between uh, gene and antigen uh, expression. So the uh, computational method that we uh, develop, that uh, we call a spatial transcriptomics uh, via epitope anchoring, uh, or stevia, precisely leverages uh, that information in order to automate the annotation, uh, well, the identification and the annotation of uh, cell populations and the analysis of uh, uh, data in um, multiplex uh, immunostochemistry experiments. So the idea is that uh, one uh, researcher that is performing a, a multiplex immunostochemistry uh, experiment and will have uh, his, his data can select some uh, site seek or AV seek or rap seek uh, reference uh, data set in order to transfer the annotations from uh, that uh, data set into the uh, uh, immunostochemistry data set in an automated way and then uh, perform a series of uh, analyses that I will uh, describe. I will not go into much uh, detail into the specifics of uh, the algorithm, the, the technical parts of the algorithm. I will just uh, briefly give uh, an overview of how it works so that it's not uh, a black box. You get kind of the, the underlying idea. So the first uh, step uh, in, in the algorithm is basically normalizing the uh, protein uh, expression levels, both on the site seek side and on the cytometry uh, side and on the immunostochemistry experiment uh, side. And to do that, we use a mixture uh, model that uh, 
basically separates uh, two components, one component corresponding to the signal and one component corresponding to the uh, background. So here we have uh, in, in this slide one example, which is a, um, a mouse uh, a splenic uh, tissue section profiled with uh, a, a codex. And we are showing the uh, expression levels of uh, a CD4 protein. Uh, where we have fit this uh, mixture uh, model to separate the background from the signal. And on the right-hand side, you see the tissue section after uh, removing the, the background, uh, where the signal is much more highlighted, and in particular is uh, showing uh, the localization of uh, CD4 expression on the uh, T cell zones of the uh, spleen as, as expected. So we need to do this uh, first normalization, because even if we are measuring the same uh, type of things, uh, both in the site 6 side and in the uh, immunohistochemistry uh, side, uh, we are doing it in a very different way. These are very different uh, type of uh, technologies. site 6 is, is based on, on sequencing uh, these uh, oligonucleotide uh, tags, uh, whereas uh, multiplex immunohistochemistry will be typically based on uh, fluorescence uh, measurements and, and imaging. So these are very different types of, of uh, of measurements, and we need to uh, first uh, harmonize and, and remove the specific uh, backgrounds of each of those uh, measurements. After that, uh, then basically we uh, consolidate the protein expression spaces of uh, the site seq uh, reference data set and the uh, multiplex immunostochemistry uh, data set. And to do that, we are using the same general principles than uh, Stuart and collaborators and Verdi and collaborators that are, for instance, implemented in, in Surat, uh, the idea of uh, uh, mutually nearest uh, neighbors and an anchoring process. But we are doing this now in the uh, protein expression space of the uh, two data sets after uh, cleaning up basically the, the data using the mixture model that uh, I was mentioning before. So now we have a, a common consolidated protein expression space where uh, each uh, point in that space is a cell that can be coming either from the site reference atlas or from the multiplex immunostochemistry uh, uh, data set. And the position of each cell in, in this consolidated uh, protein expression space is such that if two cells are close to each other, is because they have a similar antigenic profile according to the antibody panel that uh, we have been uh, using in these experiments. So once we have now this space, we can start transferring uh, annotations, transferring information from the site seq reference atlas into the uh, uh, multiplex uh, immunostochemistry uh, data set. And we do that by looking at the, uh, for each site seq cell in the consolidated uh, protein expression space, what are the uh, nearby uh, cells from the uh, multiplex immunostochemistry uh, data set. We can then uh, do some clustering uh, in order to identify cell populations. And this is a bit tricky in the sense that now we want to do clustering based on the mRNA uh, expression, uh, because that's what contains the highest amount of information, the highest phenotypic resolution. But at the same time, we would like to do uh, this clustering in a way that the resulting cell populations differ uh, enough in their uh, antigenic profiles so that we can confidently map them into the immunostochemistry uh, data set. Um, so for that, we develop a, a new uh, clustering approach. It's a hierarchical density-based uh, clustering approach uh, where the um, uh, cost uh, function is, uh, I mean, the clustering is performed in the mRNA uh, space, in the gene expression space. But the cost function is in the uh, corresponds to the modularity of the map clusters in the cytometry uh, protein expression space. So in that way, we ensure that basically the resulting clusters are such that differ enough uh, in the in their antigenic profile, so they can be mapped accurately into the uh, cytometry uh, data set, into the immunostochemistry data set. Uh, and at the same time, those clusters cannot be divided further into uh, smaller pieces that uh, still we would be able to uh, map them uh, accurately into the other uh, space. And once we have done this, this procedure, basically we can now perform a whole set of uh, uh, different spatial analysis that I will detail uh, 
in the next uh, slides, uh, we can identify, well, certainly the different cell types and states in the uh, um, multiplex immunostochemistry uh, tissue section. We can infer spatial uh, patterns of gene expression. We can uh, infer cell populations uh, interactions based on the spatial patterns of expression of uh, genes that code for ligands and receptors and so on and so forth. So I will uh, go in, in detail to, to show how this analysis work and some of the uh, other uh, features of this analysis in a particular example. This is a, a, a data set that was uh, published in the uh, original uh, publication of the uh, Codex uh, technology, Gold Set et al. in uh, 2018 uh, from the lab of uh, Gary Nolan. And uh, the data that we will be considering uh, consists of uh, three wild type mouse uh, spleen sections. Uh, they have approximately 75,000 cells in each tissue section that have been profiled with uh, a codex uh, using a 30 antibody panel. Um, so we took that uh, data uh, as a query data set that we would like to analyze using this type of uh, automated uh, uh, methods. And um, we um, uh, are going to use as a reference uh, data set, a SiteSeq data set that we have generated uh, of the mouse spleen uh, using the same uh, 30 antibody panel. Uh, this is a um, uh, Site-seq data set, so it consists not only of uh, single cell transcriptomic information of uh, different uh, cells or individual cells, but also the uh, protein expression uh, levels for uh, 30 surface uh, markers that are targeted by those uh, uh, antibodies. So here is the uh, UMAP of the uh, gene expression space of uh, this data set that we generated with all the different uh, annotations, as you can see. Uh, there are all the expected uh, cell populations that you would uh, expect in, in, in the spleen. And um, the, the way that we have uh, annotated this uh, data set was uh, in, in two different ways. One is uh, standard and the other is uh, more uh, particular to, to our lab. So the, the, the standard approach was performing um, clustering following by differential expression analysis and then based on those uh, differential expressed genes we annotate uh, gross uh, populations. But in addition, we run, uh, and this is just a small parenthesis, we run uh, an algorithm that has been also developed in, in our lab, uh, which is called relic selection, uh, to identify further heterogeneity within the clusters. Uh, heterogeneity that cannot be uh, depicted as discrete cell populations, but more as continuous gradients of expression uh, possibly related to dynamical cellular processes, such as uh, cell differentiation. So um, the, the way this algorithm basically works is that in each cluster identifies uh, gradients of genes that have gradients of expression that are incompatible with uh, just uh, random uh, effects, uh, a model of, of random uh, effects. So in this way, we identify genes that are uh, that have these patterns of expression within the, the clusters. And based on those uh, genes, we perform all these uh, other additional uh, annotations that are marked in uh, italics in, in this data set. And that, as you can see, most of them correspond to, as I was mentioning, dynamical cellular processes like uh, erythrocyte uh, maturation or neutrophil maturation or different uh, states of activations of B cells and so on and so forth. So then we, we apply a stevia basically to uh, this uh, codex uh, data set using this reference size data to uh, annotate in an automated manner uh, the uh, cell populations or the, the cells in the um, codex images. Here we have one of the uh, images of one of the, the uh, spleens, uh, one of the tissue sections where uh, stevia has uh, annotated basically uh, all the different uh, cells uh, using labels from the SiteSeq uh, data set. And you can see the very high phenotypic resolution that can be uh, achieved by uh, this method, where we are not only uh, finding cell populations that were uh, for which the antibody panel was specifically uh, devised, but also we are finding cell populations that uh, 
for which the antibody panel did not include any specific marker. For instance, different stages of maturation of uh, erythrocytes, and that's something I will comment a little bit more in, in uh, the next slides. So uh, we can do now many things with this type of uh, annotations. So uh, first of all, we can uh, go to the SiteSeq Atlas. We can uh, look at different regions of the uh, SiteSeq gene expression space and identify in the uh, multiplex uh, immunostochemistry uh, images, in the codex images, uh, cells that have a similar antigenic profile or that are predicted to have a similar antigenic profile than uh, cells with those uh, gene expression uh, profiles. So here I'm showing the um, again the um, UMAP representation of the gene expression space of the SciSeq reference atlas. I'm marking six different regions in, in that uh, gene expression space, and I'm showing for each of those regions cells in the um, codex, in one of the codex tissue sections that are predicted to have similar antigenic profile than those uh, uh, cells. And as you see, uh, you observe the expected um, uh, patterns of localization uh, based on the known architecture of the spleen. So these cells localize in uh, the uh, T-cell zones, B, -cell lo B cells localize in B cell zones, and uh, so on and so forth. But also, uh, it uh, captures differences in the spatial distribution within a single cell type. For instance, here we have two different regions uh, in the B cell uh, gene expression space that correspond to B cells that localize in different regions within the uh, B cell zones. We can, uh, we can evaluate whether these patterns of uh, localization are consistent across different uh, uh, spleens, across different replicates. So here we have used the same SiteSeq Atlas to annotate three different spleens that have been uh, profiled by, by Codex. And we see that uh, we observe basically the same uh, localization uh, patterns for each region uh, in um, in each of the three uh, spleens. So this is a, a way of validating or, or, or further supporting um, that what we think that these uh, patterns of localization are, are real. We can not only look at uh, uh, cell uh, populations in the uh, uh, immunostochemistry uh, images, in the, in the codex uh, images, but also we can look at um, uh, in, or we can infer spatial patterns of gene expression because we are not only transferring the uh, cell population labels, but we are also transferring the gene expression uh, profile. So here we have uh, two examples of the uh, predicted uh, spatial distribution of gene expression for two genes, IL-1B and BHLH-E41. And here on, on the right-hand side, uh, you see the uh, validation that we have done using uh, single molecule fees of those uh, predicted expression patterns and confirming the, the, the predictions of, uh, of stevia. Um, we can then look also at the uh, relative position of cell populations in the uh, images. Um, to see whether uh, some cell populations tend to be uh, closer to each other from than what you would expect from, from just random uh, effects. So in this heat map, we are uh, depicting that type of uh, analysis. And <clears throat> this is done using some statistics that we have uh, developed for, for this and that are implemented in, in, in software Stevia. And uh, basically in this heat map, so we have uh, in the rows and the columns, we have the uh, different uh, cell populations and uh, the, the color basically is red if those cell populations tend to be closer to each other uh, more often than what one would uh, expect. And, and there are some uh, statistical tests done in, in here. So you see that, um, first of all, it, it confirms the general splenic architecture as, as expected and as we were already seen uh, visually in, in, in previous slides. So we uh, have uh, that cells that are I mean, some cell populations are colocalizing the red pulp, some cell populations are colocalizing the B-cell follicles, and some cell populations are localizing the T-cell follicles. 
But in addition, uh, it identifies cell population interactions uh, across the splenic compartments. For instance, here we have uh, the interaction of uh, CD4 CDCs uh, with uh, uh, T cells. And these patterns, uh, again, can be validated across uh, different uh, splines. We can repeat the analysis using the same scientific atlas to annotate different uh, splines. Um, and we see that we uh, obtain basically the same colocalization patterns for those uh, cell populations across uh, splines with very high correlation uh, values, close to, to one. And uh, now that, that we have basically the uh, relative location of the different cell populations, and we have also the uh, distribution of uh, um, gene expression uh, patterns in, in, in the tissue section, we can uh, use that information to uh, infer cell uh, population interactions based on the colocalized expression of genes that code for pairs of uh, ligand and receptors. This is some example of the uh, paracrine, uh, the candidate paracrine interactions that uh, Stevia has inferred in that tissue section, in the red pulp of that tissue section that uh, I was showing you uh, before, uh, between red pulp uh, macrophages, monocyte derived uh, macrophages, uh, basophils, neutrophils, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that gives you a, a, an overall idea of the type of analysis that one can uh, do by using this type of approaches uh, of um, uh, basically transcriptome guide uh, analysis of, of uh, multiplex immunostochemistry uh, data. I think the, the other benefits of, of it is, uh, well, one is reproducibility because now it doesn't rely on, on that type of manual annotation. It is really everything done algorithmically and computationally. Um, the other type of, uh, um, of, of benefit is uh, that it's much less laborious uh, intense than, than annotating manually all those uh, cell populations. So there are several uh, types of, of questions that uh, we often get uh, when uh, presenting this, uh, this method. And I have a few slides uh, about those. So one thing that uh, people often uh, ask is, uh, what is the accuracy to capture uh, cell populations that do not have specific markers in the antibody panel? And I already mentioned a little bit about uh, that. So as I was mentioning before, one of the examples in, in this particular case that I was uh, showing you is uh, the uh, characterization of uh, erythroblast uh, maturation in the um, immune stochemistry uh, uh, images. So the panel did not include any marker for uh, erythroblast uh, maturation. However, uh, uh, this method was uh, still able to discern between uh, um, early uh, erythroblast and more mature uh, erythroblast. So here we have on the left-hand side the UMAP space of the uh, mRNA uh, data, uh, the Sidesick uh, mRNA data. And we are zooming in the um, erythroblast uh, cluster, and we are coloring it by two markers, uh, uh, CAR1 and, and GIPA, uh, two genes uh, that are uh, specific of early and late uh, erythroblasts, respectively. And we see that those differences remain in the protein space. So the uh, right-hand side uh, UMAP is the same, um, uh, the, the same data set, but now the UMAP based just on the proteins, on the uh, proteins profiled with the antibody panels, and we see the separation still between uh, red and, and green. And then after mapping that space into the uh, codex images, into the uh, tissue section, we see then still the separation between the uh, red and, and blue uh, cells corresponding to early and, and late uh, erythroblasts. So that's one example. And the other type of studies that we have uh, uh, done in order to quantify uh, how, what is the sensitivity and the specificity of these annotations in the presence or absence of the specific markers in the antibody panel has been to repeat this type of study, but removing uh, markers that are specific uh, and removing antibodies that uh, uh, target uh, markers that are specific of a given population. For instance, um, we have done this analysis or we have repeated this analysis by removing um, anti-NKP46, which is a, a very specific uh, uh, marker or antibody that targets a, a very specifically 
uh, natural killer uh, cells. So when we do the analysis without that um, uh, marker, uh, without that antibody, and then we look at the expression of uh, anti-NKP46 uh, to see what is the specificity and the sensitivity uh, of, uh, of uh, or annotations in the presence and absence of uh, the antibody, we observe that um, the specificity stays uh, very constant. It's close to 100%, um, 97% in, in both cases. And the sensitivity uh, with uh, the anti-NKP46 to detect natural killer cells is 70%, but uh, without NKP46 uh, is 40%, so still relatively high given that we do not have now any specific antibody for NK cells in the uh, panel. You may notice a very high specificity and relatively low sensitivity. And of course, as in every algorithm, this can be uh, tuned by, by uh, playing with the, by, by changing the parameters. Uh, so there is, uh, as always, a trade-off between uh, sensitivity and, and specificity in this type of algorithms. And most of the analysis that we have been uh, doing have been in the regime of high specificity and uh, moderate uh, sensitivity. Um, another type of uh, question that we often uh, get is, um, well, what happens if there are cell populations in the um, uh, in, in the site, sorry, in the codex data set or in the uh, multiplex immunostochemistry data set that are not present in the reference uh, atlas. And what happens in, in, in most cases is that those cell populations are left uh, unannotated. They are not annotated. So if, if a population in the, uh, let's say in the codex data set is, uh, has an, an antigenic profile that is very different from all the antigenic profiles present in the site seek data set, then it's left annotated. So here, for instance, we see the, the UMAP of the protein expression um, space uh, in the codex uh, data set that I was uh, showing before. And here we are labeling on the left-hand side, we are labeling the not annotated uh, cells, uh, the, the cells that were left uh, unannotated by, by Stevia. And we see that there is a substantial overlap of those cells with uh, the expression of uh, ERTR7 uh, protein, which is a marker of uh, stromal cells, and also with uh, cells that do not have uh, expression of any marker, and that they are probably uh, just uh, artifacts. So the, the reason is that uh, in, in our case, the CITESIC data set did not include any stromal cell population, and, and that's because we use uh, um, mechanical um, method for uh, dissociating the, the, the cells rather than an enzymatic uh, dissociation uh, approach and, and therefore uh, uh, at the cost basically of, of losing the stromal cells. So since there are no uh, stromal cells in the reference site seek atlas, we were unable to uh, annotate those cells in the um, in the codex uh, data set. But uh, rather than leading to false uh, annotations, to false positives, uh, what it does is that just those cells are left as uh, undetermined. And finally, the, the, the third type of analysis that we have done to uh, evaluate uh, the performance of uh, this approach is uh, to see how the mapping and the specificity and, and sensitivity of the annotations are affected by the size of both the antibody panel and also the site seek reference uh, data set. So on the left hand side, uh, you see a, a plot where we have basically subsampled uh, antibodies. We have uh, removed antibodies from the original uh, panel so that we are doing the analysis based on a smaller and a smaller uh, panel. We are removing uh, antibodies not in a random way, but uh, really removing first, uh, based on um, information theory methods, uh, we are removing first uh, antibodies that contain the least amount of information so that they are the most redundant with the other antibodies present in the, in the panel. And then we uh, see what uh, is the percentage of annotated uh, cells uh, with those reduced antibody panels. And we see that um, 
for we can go even in, in this data set like uh, to nine antibodies uh, to a panel of nine antibodies and still preserve 80 percent or almost 80 percent of the uh, originally uh, annotated uh, cells with uh, the full antibody panel and the correlation between those annotations and the uh, annotations do, using the, the uh, full antibody panel is still very high so this indicates basically that it's um, it's uh, it's very important, uh, as one would expect, how to uh, choose or, or to choose uh, the the antibody panel in a reasonable way, uh, so that there is not uh, too much redundancy in the in the antibodies. On the right hand side, we see a different bar plot. Uh, this one corresponds to changing the size of the site seek data set. So now instead of considering the uh, more than 7,000 cells that were in, in that site seek reference uh, data set, we consider a smaller number of, uh, of cells. We downsample up to a uh, data set that would contain only 1,000 cells. And we see that the main effect is that uh, the number of uh, annotated codex cells uh, decreases uh, rapidly. And the reason is that uh, when we reduce the, the number of cells in the reference site seek data set, will start uh, losing representatives of some of the smaller cell populations. And therefore, if those cell populations are not in the reference uh, atlas, we will not be able to annotate, or Stevia will not be able to uh, identify and annotate those in the uh, codex uh, sections. Okay, so um, that's uh, all about that example uh, with uh, codex uh, data. But as I was mentioning at, at the beginning, this type of approach can be used not only with uh, uh, codex data or not even only with uh, uh, immunostochemistry data, but uh, in general, it can be used with uh, uh, broad uh, cytometry data. So here, for instance, we are applying the same method to annotate site of data. So in this case, this data set is not especially resolved, but still we can use Stevia to automate the annotation and identification of cell populations in uh, this data set. So this is a, a site of data set uh, from the mouse spleen, and we have used the same uh, site seek uh, reference atlas to uh, annotate uh, using Stevia um, these uh, data sets. On the left-hand side, you see the UMAP representation of the, this data set annotated according to the Stevia annotations. And for comparison, uh, you see on the right-hand side the same UMAP space uh, clustered using uh, one of the uh, standard approaches for uh, clustering cytometry data using the, the EXIF uh, algorithm, and then manually annotating those clusters, which, those clusters, which is a type of a standard analysis that one would uh, perform. So you see that, again, the, the level of phenotypic resolution that you obtain, obtain by using this type of data-driven uh, approaches is uh, higher than uh, just by manual uh, annotation and clustering. OK, so um, I will just um, basically uh, start finalizing by summarizing kind of the, the view that we have uh, for for in the future and, and that we are currently working on. And it's what we call next generation immunophenotyping, where basically um, the researcher performs some multi-parameter cytometry experiment using any of those technologies that I was uh, mentioning at, at the beginning. And on the other side, um, there are forks like the ones that we are uh, currently doing for uh, harmonizing existing uh, site-seq, REAP-seq, AB-seq data sets that are being produced by uh, large uh, collaborative efforts like the Human Cell Atlas to build uh, reference antigenic profile atlases that are stored in an online database. So then the researcher, when wants to analyze this cytometry uh, data set, basically uses a software like uh, Stevia to connect uh, into that database reference database, the reference data set that the user would like to, to use to annotate uh, uh, the, the cells in, its, uh, in his experiment. And, um, and then Stevia basically does the rest of the, of the work of automating the annotation and, and doing this, the type of uh, uh, analysis that I was uh, presenting uh, before. OK, so. I will just uh, conclude. Uh, so basically, I think the, the main message is that, uh, well, I have presented a, a computational method that we have uh, developed and that the, 
that leverage uh, reference site seek atlases to assist in the um, annotation um, of uh, uh, immunophenotypic uh, studies and that increases the phenotypic resolution, accuracy, and reproducibility of uh, those studies. And in particular, using this type of uh, approach, we can uh, automate the uh, identification, annotation of uh, cell populations in multi-parameter cytometry data sets. Uh, we can computationally infer the spatial expression uh, profile of any uh, gene, and we can identify uh, paracrine uh, interactions. So Stevia is uh, freely available uh, in our GitHub uh, repository. This is the, the address. And I would like to finish uh, just uh, acknowledging basically the, the people who really did uh, this uh, work, and in particular, uh, Kaya uh, Gobek, who did uh, basically all the computational aspects of uh, this project, and Emma Troisi, who uh, generated the, the SiteSeq uh, Atlas and did all the experimental aspects of, of this project uh, when uh, SiteSeq was basically uh, just starting and, and there were not uh, still uh, conjugated uh, antibodies uh, commercially available, so she did all the conjugations and, and so on. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to, to me and happy to take uh, questions. All right, thank you, Pablo. Uh, as a reminder to our webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And please remember to take a moment to fill out our survey questions by clicking on the green survey icon at the bottom of your screen. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is, is there a minimum number of common feature antibodies that are needed for Stevia to work well? So that's a, that's a very good question. It depends very much on the specific uh, tissue that you, you want to, to use and the cell populations that you would like to, to identify. So it's hard to, to, to address in general. What I can say from those um, um, studies that we have done by uh, subsetting uh, the antibody uh, panel is that you can get uh, quite good annotations with uh, relatively small panels. For instance, in the data set that uh, I was presenting uh, before, uh, the, the codex uh, images, uh, we were able to obtain uh, most of the uh, originally uh, or the original annotations using just an antibody panel with nine antibodies. Uh, now it's important to choose uh, very well those nine uh, antibodies, and, and that's something that we uh, are also working on, on on basically methods that will uh, uh, inform in a quantitative way based on based on a reference atlas what is an optimal choice of antibodies if you want to to target a set of uh, of populations. But I would say that in, in general, uh, starting with nine, 10 antibodies, if they are uh, suitably uh, chosen, one can do really a, a lot in terms of uh, annotating a, a complex data set. All right, next question is, um, when designing a codex panel, what strategies should researchers employ to ensure the success of the stevia analysis? So I, I think it's important uh, that there is not too much redundancy in the antibodies. Uh, one strategy for us is to uh, start first with the reference atlas uh, that we are going to use. If that atlas is already available, you can uh, look even at the level of uh, gene expression for markers that are uh, not too much redundant, and, and there are quantitative approaches that one can uh, use, like uh, uh, lasso regression, for instance, in order to identify an optimal set of markers that are not uh, uh, redundant. There are also available uh, uh, software um, that have been developed by other labs that allow you to identify uh, optimal combinations of markers to identify uh, cell population. So I would start with that type of approaches in order to select for things that are not redundant, that really uh, 
maximize the span of the cell populations that are captured and the variability between those uh, cell populations. And, and of course, uh, for which there are good uh, antibodies, which is always a, a limitation, right? Like uh, markers for which uh, uh, there are existing uh, good commercial uh, antibodies. That, that's, that would be kind of the, the strategy that uh, we, we have been following at least in, in, with, with our analysis. Is there a particular version of single molecule RNA fish that you uh, use for your validation? So, uh, I mean, for our validation, we, we use uh, RNA scope, uh, but uh, there are other um, uh, methods that, that would work, I think, equally uh, well. So, uh, there, the, the main idea was just to. Uh, to show that the uh, patterns of localization um, that we were predicting for uh, the expression of the specific genes were really observed in, in, in real splenic section, sections. And, and that can be tricky, especially if, if the sections are, are not uh, adjacent to each other or if they come from different uh, animals, because, I mean, the, 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 the specific uh, uh, structure of the spleen will be different, basically, in, in its uh, animal. So uh, that those comparisons then need to be done uh, in reference to the location of uh, uh, T-cell uh, zones, B-cell zones, and red pulp, and, and so on and so forth. This is a question about data analysis. Do you know if different cell segmentation algorithms affect the Stevia data integration results? So that's that's a a good question, and that is a, a an important topic. is is kind of uh, outside the scope of of Stevia. The input data to to Stevia in the uh, multiplex immunohistochemistry side is supposed to be already segmented and quantified and. and uh, you should have already corrected for things like a spillover and, and things like, like that. Uh, certainly, those things can affect uh, the the analysis. I mean, not only of stevia, but any analysis that you do on the on the data. So it's an important area. Uh, it's important to to do carefully uh, those uh, things. It's not something that the stevia does. Uh, so the, the users, uh, at least in the current version, should you do it using the. Um, the, the algorithms that are more adequate for the specific type of, uh, of data that uh, is, is using, but certainly is something that, if not done uh, properly, uh, can affect the, the results, uh, especially things like uh, special uh, co-localization of cell populations uh, or special co-localization of gene expression can be misled by that type of uh, uh, artifacts in, in, in cell segmentation. Have you tried mapping RNA expression of the transcripts corresponding to codex markers from single cell sequencing data to the codex data? And if so, does it perform worse than mapping the site seq ADT? I can uh, mm -hmm. repeat that if you need. No, it's, it's good. So, um... So that's that's a good point. It's something that we have considered and that we have explored uh, a little bit. Um, so the resolution that, that you get is certainly lower. If, if you do it at least in a in a cell-by-cell -cell basis, it's certainly lower uh, than what you obtain by mapping the uh, protein um, uh, uh, itself rather than, than the genes. The reasons are multiple. First of all, uh, the genes, as, as you know, uh, the sensitivity of single cell transcriptomics is, is low, so there will be a lot of dropouts, a lot of missing information. Moreover, you are now comparing gene to protein that, uh, I mean, for some genes uh, or for some proteins will agree quite well, but not for others. And moreover, you are not taking into account the uh, technical effects from the fact that you are measuring those protein levels uh, with an antibody. Um, so, because of those reasons, you get a higher resolution by mapping uh, antibodies rather than or, or proteins rather than than genes. Now, there is some value in mapping genes in the sense that sometimes uh, that um, 
uh, antibody or an antibody targeting the protein caused by, by that gene will not be present in the uh, panel or uh, maybe there is no antibody available at all for, for targeting that, that gene. So there is value on, on, on that. Um, the, the way to do it would be different than uh, what we do using stevia in the sense that one would need to compensate for those artifacts, uh, well, not artifacts, but for that low sensitivity in terms of um, of, uh, of uh, gene expression, so for, to compensate for those uh, dropouts and, and, and so on. So one would need probably to do some sort of uh, 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 kernel uh, in order to um, kind of rather than map cell by, by cell, uh, map just regions that are kind of aggregated. But it's, 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 a, it's, it's, an, it's a useful feature that uh, we certainly are considering also in implementing in, in Stevia, because we, we see the value of it. Next question is, how do you think that Stevia integration is able to detect cell types without distinguishing, distinguishing markers in the codex data set? Does this depend on the choice of other markers that are in the panels? Yeah, so the, the idea is that, um, I mean, certainly there has to be uh, differences in at the level of, of other proteins that are profiled in order to distinguish those uh, those cells, because otherwise there wouldn't be information basically to to distinguish those uh, cells. Now the point here is that when we do um, this type of more traditional or, or manual analysis, is very much based on on binary choices. Either this marker is expressed or is not expressed. If there's expresses this combination of, of markers, or it does not express this combination of markers. Um, what we are seeing in, in this analysis is that there are uh, small variations in the expression levels of markers that, in principle, they are not specific of a given cell population. But those small variations, uh, when combined across multiple uh, proteins, allow you to discern uh, 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 one cell population from another. So for in the case of the erythroblast, for instance, there was no specific marker in, in, in the panel for uh, different uh, uh, maturation stages of, uh, of erythroblast or for the NK cells when we eliminate markers uh, for a specific marker for NK cells, they will not be, there will not be a specific marker for those, but based on the other uh, of the expression of the other proteins that are profiled uh, with the antibody panel, and uh, based on a small differences in the expression levels of those proteins, the algorithm is still able to uh, say, well, we think that this is actually an NK cell, or we think that this is actually an early uh, erythrocyte. So there has to be, of course, an imprint in the uh, expression of, of the proteins, but what I'm saying is that that imprint very often uh, is a very subtle uh, in print. It's not an on or off uh, thing in the absence of uh, specific markers, but it's more about uh, the uh, differences, uh, small differences in the expression level of uh, multiple uh, proteins. Does stevia background removal work as a replacement to the codex processor or is it complementary to it? So I'm, I'm not familiar with what is currently the, the, the codex, uh, I mean, full uh, processing uh, pipeline. Um, I think it's, I mean, at least at the, the versions that we have been looking is complementary uh, in the sense that uh, the codex processing, what uh, was mostly focusing in, at least at that time, was um, in adjusting for uh, spillover, uh, so uh, artifacts basically from uh, coming from the boundaries between uh, cells or expression of the boundaries uh, between uh, cells. Um, so I don't know if now uh, that algorithmic pipeline incorporates also this type of, uh, of background removal or, or not, but um, yeah, at, at, at the minimum is complementary, I would say. You have another question about um, cell segmentation. How do you check the cell segmentation quality? 
So here uh, for the, this specific data set and this specific codex data set, we uh, were using the process data uh, from the original paper. So we, we trust basically, I mean, the, the, the authors of, of codex that they were doing a, a good job uh, in, in, in the segmentation and, and, and so on. I think it's, it's hard in, in general in a given data set to uh, assess the quality of the uh, segmentation um, because there are no gold uh, standard. Uh, I think one can use uh, things like, um, I mean, for, for, uh, for instance, uh, markers that are known to be mutually exclusive uh, to a high degree of accuracy, if you see them co-expression in, in, in cells, um, you can use those as a, as a proxy of, of the quality of, of the segmentation. So there are that type of, uh, of strategies, but they rely on um, on very good uh, on the existence of, of that type of, of um, very good uh, mutually exclusive markers that one could use uh, to assess the, the quality of the segmentation. But in, in general, that's a it's a hard problem and, and it's something that yeah certainly is beyond the scope of uh, of, of the work that we are uh, doing. Which takes us as input already segmented data, basically. Have you checked the quality of cell typing um, by comparing your results with manual typing of cells, for example, made by pathologists um, in codex images? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have done some of uh, some of that. Um, not, uh, I mean, in, in, in particular, we we have been like. In, in this project, we have been working uh, when benchmarking the, the data. When, oh, sorry, when benchmarking the, the the algorithm, we will have been always working with um, previously published uh, data sets. So uh, we were in all cases comparing to the manual annotations that the authors of those papers uh, were doing in, in those uh, data set, data sets. We are taking those as, as gold standards, let's say, for the manual. Uh, annotation and, and performing comparisons. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in general, the annotations are very much consistent. We very rarely observe some discrepancy in, in, in the annotations. If anything, sometimes we were observing yeah, this higher phenotypic resolution in the annotation, in the automated annotations than in the uh, manual annotations, but not, uh, not discrepancies in the sense of um, the public data set saying, well, this is cell type A and and the algorithm saying this is cell type B. Um, and um, do you think data sets will become publicly available, for example, via Stevia to help researchers with cell type annotation and classification? That's that's our goal. I mean, that's uh, what I was mentioning in the, in the last uh, one of the last slides. That's that's our view for uh, for cytometry. Uh, uh, there are already a ton of data sets that are publicly available, uh, and there are tons of data sets that are being generated every month. And we think that uh, with the suitable algorithms, algorithms like Stevia and other algorithms that we are uh, developing and that other groups are developing. Uh, it should be possible to leverage those data sets for the world of uh, cytometry. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We'd like to thank Pablo Camara and our sponsor, Acoya Biosciences, 